Oh wait, I did make a cameo. <laughs> so glad to be here. So glad to welcome the the presidents and uh, candidates, presidential candidates, and he and I are going to moderate this uh, greatly anticipated session that you've all had a chance to uh, to be a part of. And I will grab a mic. <laughs> I am now <laughs> So I'll just give a, a quick rundown of how everything is going to actually run. I'll probably, I have a hard time sitting still, but I will do my best <laughs> to do so. I don't know if that's me or my kids rubbing off on each other. Uh, the way we're going to run is we're going to have a quick introduction from the candidates, which I will uh, hand over in a minute for a couple minutes each. And then we will ask some questions that the candidates have already been given ahead of time. And then we'll move into questions that you have provided for us either online or in the black box. Thank you for all those that have contributed. Uh, we've done our best to keep the spirit of those questions and make them manageable. Uh, during the curation, and then of course we'll move into a phase where uh, the youth get a chance to ask their questions, and hopefully everything will roll out. We'll do our best to moderate uh, in that time frame. I want to give uh, Tia a chance to say a few words. Good morning, everybody. Hi. How you doing? Yeah. Good, good. Um, it's just an honor to have the presidential candidates here with us. Just want to add that after we take questions from the floor from our youth participants, each of our candidates will be given two minutes for closing remarks as well. And the next big thing on the agenda is lunch, so we'll have an opportunity to talk about them in their absence. We <laughs> <laughs> bring this experience together as a community. Sound good? Yes. <laughs> We're going to start with opening remarks. Each candidate will receive two minutes to address the body. We're going to start first with Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. Thank you. Hi. Good to see you all. So sorry. All right. It's good to see everyone. It's such an honor and gift to be here. This is a this is a defining moment. This is a challenging time, a heartbreaking time, maybe one of the most difficult times that we've faced in our country and for our planet and for our very humanity. We need to be focused on unlocking the power, the moral clarity, and the mission of our faith and our people and our communities for this time. Nine years ago, when I accepted the call to be the lead minister of the UU Congregation of Phoenix, I knew that I would be working on immigration justice. I'd already been doing that in Ohio. What I didn't know was that I was going to walk into the epicenter of a national crisis, of a time when the hateful and dehumanizing and unconstitutional practices of Sheriff Joe Arpaio would become not only state law, but through copycat legislation would spread across this country. I also didn't know I'd be walking into the epicenter of a movement, a movement erupting for change. I've been serving our congregations in ministry for 18 years. Throughout that time, I've been doing community organizing as a piece of my ministry. I have never, I had never seen the kind of organizing that I saw in Phoenix when I got there. Organizing led by undocumented women and men, young, trans, queer, people of color leading the movement. And so when the national call came to come to Phoenix, I knew that UUs had to show up. That it would challenge us and move us beyond our comfort zone but that it would show us how to live our faith more fully from our hearts and our spirits. And when I issued the call, thousands of Unitarian Universalists came. Over years, we came. We showed up like no other faith movement showed up. 
And now as we face policies that are going to continue to terrorize and incarcerate people of color, Muslims, immigrants, and our planet, we need to continue to be focused on our mission, on living it faithfully, in partnership, and with impact. The work that we did in Phoenix, and we, we defeated Sheriff Joe Arpaio in November. We defeated him. And it wasn't me you used who defeated him, it was the community, but we had a role to play. We had a role to play and we played it faithfully, consistently. Phoenix needs to not be a moment. It needs to be the beginning, and we've lost some opportunities since then. But it needs to be the beginning of how we are going to live our faith differently in this time. And that is why I'm running for president, because I hope that we are only just beginning. Thank you, Susan. Reverend Allison Lilly. I know this is precious time that you have together here, so I want to thank you for making space for the presidential candidates during this precious time that you have so many things to talk about. I want to open by sharing a story. My parents came to Unitarian Universalism because they were an interfaith couple. And when they got married in the early 1970s, many houses of worship were not interested in welcoming Jewish women who were marrying Christian men. And our Unitarian Universalist congregations were some of the first places that couples like that could come. And we were casting a vision of the beloved community. And that experience of being welcomed in was so powerful when they were just trying to find someone who would be willing to marry them that they decided to visit a Unitarian Universalist congregation on a Sunday morning. Now part of that story, the story especially of my mother, was the experience also of being welcomed, but seeing barriers because of class and as a Jewish woman in a congregation that was predominantly organized around upper middle class values and people with Christian heritage. And so I was raised with a model of what does it look like to live into the theologies, our powerful theologies of the beloved community, and how do we remove the obstacles that have people who hold those theologies remain on the margins or outside of our communities. So as a candidate for the president of the New Way, I am keenly interested and have devoted a lot of my ministry to seeing both who are the people that we serve at the center of our faith and who are the people who we need to do a much better job of including and serving in places outside the congregations and on the margins of our congregations. And I believe that this work will involve three things. First, people come to our congregations or to Unitarian Universalist communities hungering for a faith that buoys their spirit and allows them to be more resilient in these times. And we need to offer a more vibrant, spiritually alive Unitarian Universalism in many of our communities. We need to unlock and ignite faith across the ages and the generations. Second, we need to work on empowering change, which means not just welcoming people with different identities into our community, but rather empowering people to be able to reshape the landscape of our faith. There's a difference between welcoming and empowering people to really shape the future of Unitarian Universalism. And third, it's about advancing justice. The beloved community within our walls, or even our online walls, is only a fraction of the beloved community. Our work and our principles must extend and ripple out to partnerships 
in the community and around the globe. And our cherished values only mean something when we turn our beliefs into actions in the world form. And so I believe that all of these three things, simply put, is about how we can learn to lead with love. They all look good. <laughs> this doesn't happen to me very often. I like it. I'm Jean Pupke, and I'm the Senior Minister of the First Unitarian Church in Richmond, where we have been struggling, struggling, struggling with work anti-racism. So I'm not going to talk to you about everything that everybody does in every place else in the whole way. I want to talk to you about can this white-centric organization, can this organization that has participated in the benefits of segregation and, and racism, that has economically benefited from the history of oppression, can it change so that your grandchildren can grow up inside of it without damage, without loneliness, without a sense of loss, without a sense of betrayal? And the answer is I don't know. Okay? That's the answer. The answer is I don't know.
could have split a congregation, right? That kind of really bold, radical justice work could split a congregation. The UUA's presence gave me cover, gave me a foundation, and helped the congregation embrace the work we were being pulled into. And that didn't happen in Ferguson. And that um, Elliott Chapel is my home congregation. That's where I grew up on the lifelong UU. So structurally, we have got, there's two, the most important thing that the Unitarian Universalist Association needs to do is cast a clear and compelling vision for our association that puts racial justice, anti-oppression, anti-oppression, and multicultural growth and justice work at the forefront of what we do. It needs to not be a siloed part of the association, but a part of everything we do. And we've got to put more resource, resources towards organizing. Strengthening standing on the side of love as an organizing arm of the UUA that deploys in moments when Ferguson and events like these happen across our country. But we are quickly able to deploy the resources of the association, individual organizers, to amplify and fortify the work that local UUs are being called into. So structurally, first, it's about putting it at the center of who we're called to be. And then it's about putting the resources behind the organizing for justice that's going to move us beyond the walls of our congregations, into the streets, into the movements for change. I want to say that in that question, I can hear the pain and the disappointment about the Unitarian Universalist Association not showing up. And I think it's important to name that there's a lot of trust building that's going to need to happen as we move forward. I want to both build capacity for the Unitarian Universalist Association to be more responsive, to reach out, and at the same time acknowledge the fact that it's been a mystery as to when the UUA does show up. Um, in certain places versus others where episodes of crisis are happening. So I also want the UUA to use its role as a convener to help network the community organizers across the association so that there is actually a method of communication so the UUA can hear about things more quickly and be more responsive and so that community organizers have an opportunity to support one another in this work. I also um, want to name, I think, uh, uh, something the UUA often looks for is a partner institution in order to uh, work on the ground. And I think that serves us and does a disservice. So the UUA will partner with an institution like the NAACP, but so often in the beginning, it's individual community organizers on the ground who are doing the work. So how can the UUA be engaging in leadership development for religious professionals, but also lay leaders who are community organizers, how might they certify them and give them entree into new circles where they're working for change? Uh, Unitarian Universalist certified community organizer might be something that could affect the work on the ground. So I'm brainstorming ways that the UA can build its capacity to be responsive, supporting work like the UU Trauma Ministry, for example, but also naming that they need to immediately open. Who's the single point of contact if something's happening in your community? And, step, and the other thing I want to talk about is building capacity in congregations. The focus has been on public witness in some places, but I believe that it is the Unitarian Universalist Association's role to partner with congregations to equip them for a holistic social justice. We don't have to wait for crises to happen, we need to be engaging with education, with agitation, with advocacy all the year long and not wait for those episodes of crisis. So how can the UUA have a national strategy for legislative advocacy, for education, for equipping leaders on the ground so that after the t-shirts and the banners go home, we're working for change for the long haul? Thank you, Allison, and the previous to Stephen and the production. Love the people I'm around with. <laughs> um, but we can't do it the way we are now. All the things we want to do, which are good ideas, cannot be done with the structure 
of the budget and the structure of the organization that exists. Period. Amen. There's a $1.8 million budget, okay, for advocacy and witness. And we just lost the director of Standing on the Side of Love who was promised resources to do interfaith witness events that could have responded to this. So let's quit the magical thinking that if we don't have money where it belongs, that we can make money somehow here in time to be there. That's what that five million bucks is about. That's about some folks saying, we've been held back for all the wrong reasons. So what I feel has to really be addressed here, okay, is the reality that we have to restructure. And I know that that's boring. You don't want to hear the candidate who talks about restructuring or, or fundraising. But the truth of the matter is that soon the 400th anniversary of the beginning of slavery in America is coming. And our analysis hasn't used much as a white community off that dime. Ooh. It's hard work, but we could engage in it. So what I'm going to say here is that we can't keep hoping for a change to happen from the outside. We're going to have to build it into the system. We're going to have to change the system. Thank you, Jean. We will move on to the next repair question. Many of you people of color report feeling alienated, disrespected, and marginalized in their own UU congregations. What systemic changes need to take place to address this issue? And what are some specific, measurable, and innovative ways you propose UU congregations increase their diversity of underrepresented minorities, Black, Latino, and Asian? Sorry, I'm going to take this one? Okay. Yes, please. Yes. Sorry, Allison. No, no, sorry. <laughs> well, I want to name you something because I think that when I was a young adult, there was a network of anti racists being cultivated across the association, and that um, there was a commitment to actually do the anti racism work, not only to evaluate what was happening at the center, but to do the entire system as having goals. and really leaning into those goals and developing a leadership uh, pipeline for people to train and equip new people coming into our congregations, which happens all the time. And so it, it is so disappointing to hear about things coming from youth conferences where youth of color want to caucus and gather and are being told by the community that they can't do such a thing. Just last year there were Facebook posts about that. When that was something that we fought so hard and those spaces um, for people to caucus and then come back together offered vibrant learnings that helped us transform a lot of the um, youth and young adult networks at the time. And so we need to get recommitted to that work. Um, second, I want to talk about um, some innovative ideas. What does it look like to center the experiences of Black, Latino, and Asian Unitarian Universalists? It, when we are creating worship resources, so many of our saints, so many, so much of our liturgies, so many of our, um, everything that we present is so centered in whiteness. And so how can we increase the worship uh, resources and equipping leaders across the association, lay leaders as well, who involve, or who are actually leading a lot of our worship, so that we're centered in those experiences. Another thing is we know that um, scholarships were a barrier for uh, black people to be able to come to the General Assembly. Well, that is quadruply so for uh, folks attending divinity school. So when I was at the UUA, one of the things I did was fundraise for grants to, to reach out to new populations. What would it look like to fundraise specifically for people of color to be able to go to divinity school with a needs-based program and a merit-based program that would be determined by people of color, what, how that would look. Um, and then finally, I want to mention, again, networks for our youth and young adults of color. So often, youth and young adults um, have experiences that are far more multiracial in their schools and even in the religious education program. 
and then they pour into uh, an adult congregation that centers in whiteness. So how can we strengthen the networks for um, youth and young adults of color across the association to create opportunities of community both within their congregations but truly around the country and around the globe. With technology, we don't even have the barriers of the United States. And so these are some of the um, programs that I think we need to be looking at investing in. Uh, thank you, Allison. <laughs> you? So I want to start by saying I'm really afraid of trying to attract people of color to our congregation. Oh, oh. <laughs> Tessa and I can tell you some stories. Uh, Anita and I can tell you some stories. If people are gonna fend them faster because there's more folk coming, I'm not sure I wanna be in that parade. What I would like to do, however, is to notice the predominance of congregational communities in our faith where there is a skill lack, a deficit of skill in just basic stuff, how often that happens and start to confront that. Because who can feel at home in a land of microaggressions? Yes. So we have work to do. We have work to do. Um, and it's white work. White work largely. How can we raise consciousness so that we can trust ourselves not to become an organization that collects people of color? Oh. Even in my own congregation, you know, people are very excited when a new face walks in, and I panic a little bit. Can you, can you pull your mic just a little closer? Yeah, yeah, I panic a little bit sometimes. Because I know how many times we've broken hearts. So the basic work of decentering whiteness is so fundamental to what we're doing. That has to be the priority. Oh. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> So one is having heard conversations from UUs of color um, and white UUs about what draws them to our faith. And one of the distinctions, and this is a generalization, so this is not true for everyone. But one generalization is that white people often say, I come to the congregation for community, to be in a community of like-minded people. And what I hear many people of color say is I come for our theology. I come because I'm a Unitarian Universalist and I put up with the community. <laughs> because this is my faith. Okay. So we need to move our congregations beyond being collections of quote-unquote like-minded people which erases the identities of many people in those communities. And one way to do that is to be mission focused. Is you use without, we're not theologically grounded enough that we get focused in a social club mentality as opposed to being led by our faith for the world we want to see and build and create, right? So mission first, that's one piece. Number two, power. My analysis, my power analysis of the UUA is that we distribute power so vastly, you know, it, it's, it's dispersed in little pockets all over. And what that means is that A, if you don't know the system inside and out, it's really hard to build change. Two, you can't hold the system accountable. And three, if you do know the system well, you can move it any way you want. So we get power players that aren't necessarily elected. We have elected leaders who can't be as effective as they hope to be because they're not given enough power and then they're not held accountable. Now, that power structure favors the status quo. 
And it's not just in Unitarian Universalism where we see that. We vote for hope and change, and we get the same thing, right? So we've got to change structurally. We cannot, and I have a lot more to say on this, but those are two things that are critical for our faith moving forward in the local congregation as well as in the association. So that people of color in our communities can affect change and be leaders of change for our movement. Thank you so much. Moving to our next question. Do you know who your time to speak first? Mm -hmm. For the past several years, the UUA has dismantled the anti-racism tools which seem to be affecting change within our faith, rather than updating and improving them. They have been replaced with programs like Mosaic, which is nice and very safe for white people. How willing are you to encourage UUs to be uncomfortable in doing the crucial work of anti-racism? Please explain. So, um, the reality of how we engage this question institutionally is a function of budget more than anything. Mosaic's not a bad place for some people to begin a conversation. It's not a bad place for someone whose race consciousness is rising. But when it happens every three years because of budget cuts, when it was originally intended to happen as a gathering every year, it becomes less and less effective when our youth can't gather, it's less effective. It's so nice to be here because you're all together. You know, good for you. You, you told us you wanted to be together. But the fact of the matter is the convening was the work of people who just jumped in and got it done. So, so what I want to say is that the tools will not change while the money is the same. So if we raise $5 million to make sure that Blue has $5 million, we won't get it done. Let's raise $10 million instead, because the programs of the UUA at $1.8 million on this topic are not adequate for witness and the work at hand. I, I'm not sure $5 million is. I'm not sure $10 million is. So what we need are communities of accountability so that the systems cannot be capriciously deconstructed when the budgets get tight. Right now, our system is designed to support people being employed as opposed to people responding to circumstances that arose. And that's painful. In my own congregation, we are so research, or, excuse me, resource thin that when a critical event happened, which the folks in my community who were black wanted to see a response to, we had an intern in place and I was on sabbatical and there was no way to communicate about how much we expected people to turn out to this event. And we broke people's hearts. That's resources, folks. It's not because we didn't want to be there, it's resources. The vision we have to begin to see is that we are in charge of changing this whole thing. That engaging with one another honestly in communities of accountability is how we begin to say, we're not going to let things slip and come apart like we did Jubilee, like we did every third year Mosaic. People in the back corner over there can tell you stories about how every time something good comes along, we've got to take it apart and devalue it and cut the budget. That's the habit of mind that says we remain. We remain constrained by outside forces. We've got to change that. I don't think it's a budget issue. I think it's a mission, vision, and priority issue. Resources will never be unlimited. So it's always a question of where you need to increase your investment and where you're going to cut so that you can continue in a long-range strategic vision for the faith. So if we are clear that our mission as Unitarian Universalists 
is to grow into multiracial, multicultural, multigenerational religious communities for this time, grounded in love and justice, then that will guide how we spend the money that we do have. Mission has to come first. That directs how we make the choices. When we look at it just as a budget, we don't know what to cut. You know, one of the ways that we've grown in Phoenix, and we've grown income, we've grown our pledging income by 50%, and we did this in Youngstown, Ohio, too, a much different kind of place than Phoenix, was being clear on mission so that we could put the resources where they would make the most impact. And that helped drive our growth and our capacity to work more fully in the larger world. To me, what's missing, what's really absent for our faith is that clear vision. We need, again, I know I said this earlier, but our multicultural work can't be a silo of the association. It has to be at the center. We have to be investing in prof religious professionals of color, having them be a part of the leadership team of the UUA so that that diversity, that multicultural mindset is shaping everything as we go forward. And as far as, I think part of this question was how comfortable are you with leading people into discomfort? You know, I love this analogy that what do we do when people are dying? we make them comfortable, right? That's a path to hospice. So discomfort is about growth. Discomfort is about change. And I will continue to lead us into bold leadership that pushes us beyond our comfort zones because that is where we will grow and thrive and change. where the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond has been, and Crossroads also, another one, has been sending Unitarian Universalist leaders who have actually changed the analysis of race for many people across the association. And I'm so grateful for the experiences that I had as a young adult and the trainings that I had um, from these organizations and from the UUA anti-racism trainers, which have been totally cut off at this point. And I believe that I am a more effective organizer in the community because of the way that those experiences live in my bones, live in my bones these decades later. And I still am learning all the time. And in fact, the paradox is that we have learned more about anti-racism training and how to equip people um, to proactively be anti-racist, and now we are not funding the trainings. And so I want to name that uh, deep disappointment. There's an opportunity, I think, that lies before us, which is very significant. And I want to say something, too, is that I was part of looking at the youth and young adult ministry programs, and there was something named the Mosaic Project by the way, and it had at its core bullets that went to the heart, yes, of multiculturalism, but also of addressing anti-racism and dismantling the structures of oppression that are embedded in our institutions. And so I want to say it's a choice. There was a vision for a mosaic project that was about absolutely not forgetting the importance of anti-racism, so people made a choice. And here's what I'm wondering, and this gets straight to the point about discomfort. I believe that as a minister, it is my job through sermons, through um, many opportunities to help inspire people to talk about how discomfort is a key to change. And as a white woman, I believe that it is part of my responsibility as a faith leader to talk about how my white discomfort is not equivalent with the lives of black people. And so what does it look like? What does it look like to be faithful to a vision that truly transforms lives across our congregations and the entire association? We are going to move, there was one more prepared question we were going to skip it in reference so we can make sure that the youth get a chance to ask their questions. And this is our first question that will be new to you, and we are going to start with Susan. 
I'm going to read it. I've given the candidates a copy of it so they can read as I read along. Um, many black UUs identify with our faith, but are not active members of any congregation or fellowship. What will you do to support UU identity that is not necessarily bound by official church membership? Good question. Um, and it's a good question. I kind of just want to name that I think this is a question that we're facing all across our faith and we need to be in conversation about it. I don't have all the answers. I want to work collaboratively and figure out what are some um, tactics and skills we can build to reach out to all kinds of new youths who are not affiliated with our congregations. Our congregations need to change and not be social clubs so that more people can find inroads into them. I think there's an opportunity with social media and the way that our president and our, can use social media to reach out and to communicate with people who are who identify as UUs but are not in traditional congregations, connecting them. I think we can partner with the Church of the Larger Fellowship in new ways to expand that. And, um, and I think that the vision of Blue, your vision is about from what I understand and from the work I've heard from your leaders is about creating pastoral networks and supports for black UUs who are in congregations or not in congregations. So I think you know supporting Blue with funding around that vision is another place. Maybe perhaps the most important place. I mean, just to name it, you know, we as three white candidates don't have all the answers to these questions, but need to work in collaboration, partnership, and the leadership of Blue to change the faith. So I love this question. This is a question that's been on my heart um, for the last 20 years, and a lot of the ministry that I've been engaged with has been working with Unitarian Universalists who find themselves outside of our congregations, starting with campus ministries. And I was involved in the first online ministry project at the CLF, uh, the Church of the Younger Fellowship, to imagine networks of Unitarian Universalists connecting beyond where they were located in the world. And I'm on the board and have been um, just blessed to be in relationship with staff members who are on fire like Lena and who have built up networks uh, across the association for black people to gather, and, and also um, other volunteers that are leading covenant circles for people of color across the association. So I definitely am devoted with my time to this work. And finally, we talk about, um, I think we, see, we fail to see places where Unitarian Universalism needs to enter. And I'm conscious that here in New Orleans, we have our largest number of prison members from the CLF right here. And so how are we serving a population that is way skewed towards Unitarian Universalists of color? And when I tell people about this ministry, they can't even imagine Unitarian Universalists in prison. And so we have some work to do about where we think Unitarian Universalists can be found. I also think there are opportunities um, to support uh, language ministry. Again, why do we think our theology sounds better in English? I live in a community that's 34% Spanish speaking. And so we are engaged in interfaith and justice work, which often begins in worship um, in English and Spanish. And how can we imagine, I'm a French speaker, and how can we imagine our faith in ways, again, that move beyond the cultural confines that diminish us? And this is, I think, critical work. And in, in addition, I think congregations can be a powerful place. After all, I spent my, a significant point of my, part of my life working in them. Demographics shift over time and our congregations close. Since we have effectively planted so many congregations in white communities where we've then welcomed people of color, let us be then intentional to plant seeds of ministry, emerging ministry by, by helping grants for new staff or planting new congregations in communities of color where from the get-go the black experience is centered. And then maybe that community can learn how to welcome white people. <laughs> <laughs>
we must reimagine the ways that we deliver our faith because our faith is so much greater than these cultural confines we, we restrict it to. So we want to name first that some people don't feel at home in our congregations for a reason. We talked about that. So let's change some of the reasons is one first thing we want to talk about. But then secondly, third way communities are really important in our faith, generally speaking. Um, for college age children, uh, college age kids, for children who have a, a predominant identity that is not UU or race or other, um, for them, the gathering places are everything. They're life-giving, they're life-saving. We should be more skillful as a faith in creating those kinds of spaces. And part of the reason we don't is because we have this archaic understanding of how congregations will gather and be autonomous and not ever allow themselves to be interdependent. So that whole mindset undermines the third way category in our faith. So we need to, ch we need to change our theology, our practical lived theology, to see our congregations charged with the responsibility to foster and not get in the way of the creation of third space communities. Congregations that meet on Sunday should have house churches too. Congregations that, that gather um, in leafy white suburbs should have other campuses. But we are not at a space where our minds are there yet, even when our hearts occasionally glimpse that beloved community future. You know, so we kind of get in, in the way. We have rules that get in the way and other pieces that get in the way. So when I, the way I think about this though, is that we must find ways to sing our way into a new reality. We're not gonna get there by intellectually restructuring, and I disagree with Susan, we have to change the budget, we just do, but all those things won't matter if we can't sing our way, dance our way, paint our way out of our hearts into a new consciousness that will allow us to create space that we're not charging, you know? To flower, to see something flower and not pick it. To plant a seed that is going to grow a tree and we're not going to sit underneath its shade. Deuteronomy says, dig well, but we're not going to drink it. So we have to have the mindset that looks generations away, as our native brothers and sisters say the seventh generation with a fierce urgency of now in the back. Thank you very much. Allison, we're going to start with you this time. The UU movement has gained significant notoriety, culture, and tradition from black culture and black struggle. When will the UUA begin to acknowledge African and African American spiritual traditions and belief systems? So this question really gets at the heart of something that I think we absolutely need to be changing about our movement, which is that we are still organizing our congregations and our worship lives around um, how they were organized um, in, the, in the 1950s, actually even in times of segregation and when the entire congregation, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, often reflected upper middle class white Protestant values. And so I think we need to actually pay attention to the diversity that exists and actually create um, systems of governance and 
and actually experiences that reflect, reflect the wisdom of the world's religions that we say are a part of our faith tradition. So this gets at the heart of the change work that I believe is ours to do as a religious tradition. And I think that it's partly, too, about wrestling. I wrote my thesis at Harvard about the relationship between the Jewish liturgical year and Unitarian Universalism, because Unitarian Universalists, the first other tradition they felt they owned was Judaism. But Judaism, but they didn't own it, actually. It looked a lot like Christianity. And so what would it look like for us to acknowledge and honor the ways that we have fallen short? There, that is critical work. And yet, how do we move into a religious pluralism that honors the center of Unitarian Universalism and the source traditions that are in the center of so many of our lives? And I believe my congregation is actually growing in part because of this very work. And I believe that it's part of that engagement um, of, of reconciliation and reformation work that we have to do in the movement about how we treated people of color in our midst. And it is absolutely uh, critical work. And I think part of it is about, again, centering black leaders. Often the stories that the UUA will promote is about um, white people helping people of color in the community beyond. But there are so many leaders of color in our congregation, certainly in mine, who are actually leaders in their own right. We need to change the stories of, of that we're propagating that are perpetuating a kind of paternalism, a kind of ownership of, of other traditions, and allowing them to flourish uh, from within. And again, I think, uh, this is the work that's on the agenda, so I'm, I'm grateful uh, for this question. Thank you. There was a strip of paper with the question, so I just want to make sure I see it. Okay, so I want to tell you a story. So in my humanist congregation that I went to in Richmond in 2006, they would sing from the Gray Hymnal and the New Teal Hymnal, and they could sing anything in there, including those uh, tunes and, and lyrics that came from spiritual traditions, right? And the choir could sing music that came out of spiritual tradition and out of the traditions of Africa and other places. And when uh, there was a gospel choir in town that had no home, mainly because they were not welcome in the church where they started, which tells you something about them. They were out in front. We offered them a home and we asked them to please consider becoming um, part of our regular liturgical experience and, and we had them come and, and sing for them. And they sang exactly the same song that we had in our hymnal and we had sung in our choir, and we hadn't called the meeting. <laughs> because clearly the senior minister was trying to turn us into a Christian church. Now what is the reality that gives us that filter? You know? And how does that get changed? This is a struggle, so how are we gonna change it? And quit being comfortable with the exploitation and not the real thing. So we had our meeting. And at the meeting where we thought maybe everyone would talk about how they, they could not accept this theology, instead the cradle you use in the congregation got up and said, the folks who've been raised up in Unitarian Universalism, I love this. This speaks to my heart. This is truth, and it's not necessarily what I believe, but it's what they believe, and they need to be welcome here to say what they believe and sing it out loud. And the folks with the critique kind of like were taken back by the cradle of Unitarian. Yet, because we're in the space experiencing the similar experience over time, now that gospel group seems to in our regular 
rotation on the second Sunday of every month. And people can't imagine it being different. They couldn't imagine a way forward, but we, we got there. And not imagining it being different. So the struggle remains one in which traditional beliefs need to be brought into experience, not just into an argument. So when will the UUA begin to acknowledge the African and African American spiritual traditions and belief systems that inform our faith? I think one key answer is when our leadership reflects that diversity. When our leadership broadly reflects that diversity, that is when we will really be celebrating without misappropriation, without misuse, when we will really be living in the, the beloved community that lives in our hearts. And this has to be a clear priority of the association. It has to be a clear strategic priority. And when I talked about the budget, it was not so much, I mean, yeah, the budget needs to change, but if we don't know how we want to change over the long term, we won't grow that way. So I think that vision and that commitment to anti-racism, anti-oppression, multicultural, collaborative, diverse leadership at the highest levels of our association is where it needs to begin. And then that needs to be an inspiration and a model for all of our congregations. Okay, Jean, you're first on this one. It's a multi-question, so I'll make sure you the whole thing as I read. I, I just love the torture you with these pieces of paper. I really can't help it, so sorry. Okay, so some of us <laughs> some of us feel that the current UUA leadership runs our faith like a corporation. And we don't believe it should be run that way. We believe this corporate model of governance and administration is ruled by hierarchy and rooted in white supremacy. A. I am so sorry. I was so excited about that question. That is the next question. I'm going to go back and review. <laughs> it is a great question, and you will hear it, and I do apologize. Let me go back to number eight, which is also a good question. It's been 20 years. I know. Different question. Different question. Rewind, so let me, let me rewind and reset. And I was super excited about that question. But you will hear it. So that was, that was the preload. Here's the real deal. It's been 20 years since our association passed the 1997, 1997 resolution to become an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural institution in face of expanding. Blatant white nationalism and autocracy. What are your personal and theological imperatives that guide you in this direction? What are, where are we as an association now? And how will we support leadership that has the capacity to fulfill this resolution? Can you see that one? Okay. 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 There's like boxes and A, B's and C's here. <laughs> so, um, okay. Let's, let's shorthand this. How do we become the beloved community? I think might be the question. And we are far from there. But the theological imperative that I am called to says that we, we can't arrive alone. Some part of us can't arrive alone with the beloved community. Everybody's got to arrive at the beloved community. Our faith has sometimes mistaken other identity items for idols. Um, and a lot of them are white centered, but a lot of them are theological. Humanism is good, theism is bad. It's, it's been a lot that 
one point being straight is good, but being non-straight is not good. To make change though, to really make change, we have to create different experiences that change heart, hearts and minds, which means we have to change structure. And part of the reason I chose the logo that I did was to represent, for my campaign, was to represent the fact that when everyone is involved in the changing experience, when, when we're knitted together in a community of accountability, then in fact, you and I can have the experiences that start to teach us how we can move forward into spaces we can't presently see, but are still there. The association now is not in a good place on this, but my leadership will restructure things to create that, to create that interspace interdependent, interreliant awareness that will, in fact, create the places we know and can see and experience and move toward so that everyone, everyone arrives at the love of community in some future day, not in my lifetime, I think. My job will be to think of those future generations. imperatives that guide my ministry is the theology the theology that no one is outside of the circle of love and that primarily number one we are called to love one another beyond difference beyond any fear fear which is right now and has been for a long time affecting our hearts. It always is a faith of love beyond fear, of compassion, and of drawing the circle wide. So that's the theological imperative for my ministry and my vision for our faith. I think as an association, and I wanna to go to that corporation question, but, um, that we struggle, our process impedes our mission. The way we do our business is an obstacle to achieving what we wanna see. And we do not sufficiently prioritize the theological and spiritual depths of our faith. My platform for our faith, the three things that I've identified we need to move forward forcefully, spiritual vitality, partnership and being organized for impact. And I put spiritual vitality number one because that is the place where we need to grow. That is the place we'll, that will build courageous hearts, that will build resiliency, and that will help us move forward in that vision of the beloved community. So right now we are just, I think we are hampered by process that eats our energy, drives us into fake fights. We need some important fights. But it drives us sometimes into the wrong fights. And we can change our structure to unleash our power and our mission more effectively. So my theology and my understanding that drives me is about how the creative healing power of love is able to break into suffering in our lives and in the world around us and help us to create a new thing there. And my personal mission that drives my understanding here in terms of this question is that human beings have need of inspirational communities that buoy their spirits and that allow them to be more resilient and to face truth about what is the direction
action of that creative healing power of love and where it is calling us. And I believe that black humanists, black Christians, black people rooted in African traditions, black Jews, black Unitarian Universalists with no hyphens, also, some folks, this is the faith that resonates with their spirit. And so we are called, absolutely called, to create a religion that lives up to that, to that vision, which is ours. I think that we as an association are really struggling and, and have committed and then defunded our commitment and divested our commitment to these principles. And I think we really must, must invest in, in creating the changes around the anti-racism, multicultural, anti-oppressive institution that we want to create. And so something I plan to do as president in my first 100 days is to interview, it's been since I think 1980, since there was a community stand of people of color who were working at the BUA. And I want to interview people of color who left the UA, there's a lot of truth there, people who are on staff at the UA, and I want to include UU institutions and congregations across the association to really face what it is that we can learn from a community stand and create some priorities out of that stand for how we can move forward and create goals for change together. I think the work of listening and learning and creating a strategy, and I'll mention this, that during one of the presidential elections for the UA, I was part of a collective that gathered groups from different parts of the association, drum, interleave, the youth caucus, the young adult caucus, um, Luna at the time, Women's Federation, to actually create an intersectional plan so that we would not succumb to the system of hierarchy which always pits the benefit of one over another to create a holistic vision for the UUA for the president to sign on to. And as president, I will be committed to that kind of thinking. Just a quick shout out, folks. We see some of you fanning. We are trying to get the heat adjusted in this room. I know some of you are hot. We're on it. Don't give her a whole missed opportunity. Hello. <laughs> the question that we jumped the gun on just a little bit, we're going there now. <laughs> some of us feel that the current UUA leadership runs our faith like a corporation, and we don't believe it should be run that way. We believe that this corporate model of government and administration is ruled by hierarchy and rooted in white supremacy. What concrete steps would you take to shift our faith away from a white supremacist corporate model? And who or what organizations will you reach out to in order to assist the UUA to resist white ways of structuring and governance that inevitably harm black people? Uh, the last question, I would reach out to the leadership and membership of Blue and Drum as in, the, in uh, being informed about how we reshape governance. That's critical. Um, and I think there are also opportunities um, to reach out to movement leaders beyond Unitarian Universalism as well, to have that be a larger conversation. Hmm. Um, there's really two things at play. And this is complicated. I want to stand up. Can I stand up? Okay. I think about this a lot. I think one of the strengths that I bring is that I can see a system and, and see where we want to go and how to make changes to get there. And so, as I said about my power analysis, I think one of the things that happens is that we don't actually empower leadership. At GA last year, how many people were at GA last year? I was so 
upset that the national conversation on race didn't pass as the CSAI, as the Congregational Study Action Issue. We give so much power to the General Assembly that that, that, that room favors the status quo. Okay, so we elect leaders who say, who come, you know, who talk to our faith about where we need to move, and then we empower 2,000 people in a room, and it's really hard for 2,000 people to be bold and courageous, right? And it doesn't reflect the diversity that we want to see in our movement, and so it um, depletes the power of the voices of color and trans voices and GLBT voices in our movement. So. I actually think we need to give more authority to the people we democratically elect. And then we need to create a governance structure that insists on collaborative leadership. Collaborative leadership. So that no one voice, my certainly one perspective is not sufficient. Right? We have to lead collaboratively. That has to be a part of the governance structure and I want to be in conversation about that. But I want to lift up that there are these elements of hierarchy, and then there are these elements that disperse power that preserve and protect the status quo, and that too needs to change. So having grown up a Unitarian Universalist, and attended many general assemblies and board meetings of all sorts over the years, I have seen how Unitarian Universalists, when we're not at our best, use systems of governance like a weapon. For who has the power in the room to affect change and say something important, and who is silenced? I believe that the president is a spiritual leader, is a leader in terms of justice, and is a leader, yes, in terms of running a nonprofit, but a nonprofit is not the same, especially a faith based nonprofit, as a corporation. Where you derive trust and power and resources uh, come from a completely different place. And I believe that as a nonprofit, we are not accountable to people for making money that drives so many decisions and greed, and again, what I mentioned before, systems that reinforce the benefit of one over the benefit of another, and that we must refuse to really cooperate with systems that create that kind of context. And our system of governance needs to be transformed in a way that it opens us up to truly hearing all of the voices of Unitarian Universalists and creating a Unitarian Universalism that actually is accountable to a multiracial, multigenerational, multicultural, religiously plural future and moves in that direction rather than being wed to the present, which falls at a great distance from that. So how can we gather stakeholders to allow us to create and lead into those kinds of changes is very much alive for me in this. And I believe that it's about looking at the Unitarian Universalist Association and looking at our funding priorities and how they reflect what it is that people of color say that they want. When we do a social media campaign, do we pour all the revenue into something that preferences white folks? So how do our decisions at every level of the association reflect priorities that are not that multi-generational, multiracial future that we dream about? And I just want to say this, that I have in my email today um, something from my son's preschool about stricter um, entry situation because of bomb threats at the, he goes to a, a Jewish preschool because of bomb threats 12 miles away. And at the middle school on my block, swastikas are drawn on that building. So white supremacy and systems of white supremacy are not good news. And my family story and my religious story is a part of it. So I take this very seriously. And we'll be looking to have conversations 
with others about their ideas too. I'll defer to my sister to stand up. <laughs> uh, corporations are not a good model for faith communities, mostly. I agree with that assessment. But the question asks, the question states that the leadership of the UUA is leading this faith like a corporation. That's what the question states, and I think that's true. I noticed some behavior recently in which it was very clear to me that the top leadership of the UUA were trying to avoid being the victim of a lawsuit. They wanted the lawsuit to stay with the district. Really? Okay? They wanted to control risk. They didn't want to put our assets at some vulnerability. To be effective, we have to be an agile organization, a flexible organization. But we also have to be a non-white supremacist, non-white supremacist system organization, right? And corporations are a pretty good weapon and system for the domination of white culture, largely, but not only. So how do we become the effective organization without resisting change, which is the real quest in the UUA. It can be done. We can organize with different priorities, which means different accountabilities than the ones we have, where we're avoiding legal entanglements as opposed to fighting white supremacy. I'll be honest with you. Some people's analysis probably is, well, you're the one who was in corporate life for a long time. These, these folks are relatively unsullied by corporation. <laughs> Relative. They didn't go to Harvard. <laughs> you know, we all have our story, right? And I've been on the UUA board, so I'm in part responsible for something Right? Like getting us off Beacon Hill. Like shrinking the board, which may have inadvertently decreased in the short run our diversity and our plural perspective. But it also increased relationality that led a board to respond to say, something's got to change. So what I want to say is, it's not that simple. Voices can rise and they can change the day. It's not how we're organized. It's who has the heart for what we're organizing. And just to give everybody a little bit of a heads up in terms of where we are, we curated the questions and thoughtfully worked through them, but we have had to smush some together and skip a couple and do some black people magic up here. So, we have two more questions that we're going to ask all of our candidates, and then we have three youth questions from the floor. That should take us up to maybe 15 minutes before lunchtime. We'll make sure everybody can get out of here and breathe and stretch before we gather to eat and be boosted. Mm -hmm. So we have two more questions, and then we'll go to our three youth questions, and then we'll have time to break before lunch. Yes, you still with me? Yes. Still with us, thank you so much. And thank you for your contributions with the questions. Okay. All right, Allison, you're starting first. Many black UUs and other people of color are interested in taking on greater roles in our faith, whether as religious educators, commissioned lay ministers, chaplains, or parish ministers. Too often, they are confronted with the barrier of the rising cost of higher education and related training. This is a two-part question. What solutions would you advocate for in our faith to address the increasing costs and debts associated with theological education? And 
Specifically, what are your thoughts on the Masters in Divinity requirement, given that some black Hebrews cannot afford the dignity of recognition by the UVA? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad I anticipated this question, actually, <laughs> with one of my um, other questions, um, because I think it gets to the heart of it, which is that I know that as, um, as, a, as a mother, um, I have a connection immediately with the families that show up. And I think as when I was a young adult, I had an immediate connection to young adults. And I think we are just wrong-headed if we think that we can move in the direction of a multiracial, multicultural, multigenerational future if we do not empower leaders of faith from communities of color in our congregation. And I want to also lift up another group because there are ministers of color and religious educators of color that come from outside traditions that are already have the recognition of their faith tradition and they make the hoops incredibly challenging for them to come through to become ordained Unitarian Universalist ministers. So I want to include them in this. So one of the things I worked with the development department at the UA fundraising grants. And so again, I would see us with an intentional campaign to raise um, funds for um, people of color to be able to have access to these educational systems. And as I said, too, I think it's really important that it be partially need based because we know because of societal um, challenges that people of color are going to be disproportionately affected by the rising tag, price tag of higher education. And then I would put in the hands of people of color determining what are the other criteria in terms of who can we fund in any given year um, to proceed towards this, um, this degree. And I also think we need to invest in, and I, I don't want it just to be about ministers, because actually I think sometimes we get the history wrong. We think ministers are responsible for all changes in congregations, and it's always a partnership. And I believe that All Souls DC, for example, had a religious educator, an African-American woman, who made a huge difference and, and maybe the initial difference in the turning of that tide towards a multicultural, multiracial institution. And so I want to not forget the importance of leadership development networks for lay leaders and uh, religious educators of color um, specifically. And I think we have to be part of a broader conversation across the country about how uh, college education and a graduate school education is completely out of reach for the vast majority of Americans. And what does it look like to have more creative ways of credentialing people for the experience, life experience that they may bring so they can spend less time um, if they're not um, in need of it? I can think of um, quite a few examples um, of ministers of color who would like to be ordained Unitarian Universalist ministers but don't know if it's worth going through all the hoops. We're getting to stand up, but you're not. <laughs> Go ahead if you want to. That's fine. Um, so in the 11 years that I've been at First Unitarian in Richmond, there have been 14 people who've either come forward out of our congregation, uh, identifying themselves as wanting to seek union ministry, or were interns that came to us. Okay? So of those folks, um, three of them are Baptist ministers who wanted to become the U, union minister, who wanted to be fellowship in you. And, uh, and one has been to a Baptist seminary, and that was kind of where he was coming from when he was going to school. So four people total coming through in that group of 14. We had to do such gyrations to create spaces for them not to go broke in the process of becoming fellowship in UU ministry that you can't help but see the, the injustice of this. But let me add to that, that there are folks who are not people of color, who are poor folks who are going through and racking up, some of them close to $100,000 of debt that's not, and then they're going to go out and serve congregations that may pay them $54,000 a year? That does not add up. 
So, so conversations are going on. Doesn't have to go on in my head alone, but there's some conversations going on about what do we need and, and what is healthy and what is available because we have a crisis. 228 congregations in this faith are 34 persons or smaller. So professional answers to those questions are not always relevant. Our analysis has to look at the numbers and say, these don't add up. And not be moved off that point by some glorious vision of who we want to hear in the pulpit. We've got enough preachers and enough technology. What we don't always have is people who will go to the congregation, sit, and listen. And it doesn't have to be that you have the MDiv to make that happen. It also doesn't have to mean that you have to have the nameplate in the UUA to make that happen. And it also doesn't mean that somebody has to come from Boston to make it happen. The reality is that we have enough strength, enough capacity, and enough <coughs> insight amongst ourselves to gather together as long as we talk about what we're aiming for, a vision that we're pointing to. And that vision, to me, is a faith that is alive and on fire and relevant to the day. We haven't mentioned 45 since we came in this room with you, but that's the that's the house that's on fire right now, folks. They're going to start taking apart our public education system and other, uh, you know the list. That's where the fire is. Will we fight it together? Many of our forms no longer serve us. Our forms of uh, ministry, uh, the way we organize ourselves no longer serve us, and we need to be able to let go of what no longer serves us. It's interesting to me, and has always been interesting to me, that we have, we really just have ministers. You know, we don't, and they're ordained ministers. We don't have a sufficient title for lay ministry and commissioned lay ministry and recognizing that so many people in our congregations do ministry and are ministering to people. We need to break through that barrier and I'm sure it's related to white privilege and supremacy and kind of narrowing the confines of who gets to be called a minister. We kind of the moment is too urgent right now. The question is, how do we unlock the capacity of our leaders? How do we provide training that's accessible? How do we build leadership up and commission folks out? And so I think everything, to some extent, everything needs to be on the table. When I was in the Ohio Metro District, we had a commissioned lay leaders program, lay ministers program. I think those, and we're looking at expanding that, the, re, the UUA is, how to share that. How can we have a title of ministry for our members and our staff who do ministry and recognize that. And then they're building up new ministries and new ministers. So I think that's a key piece is providing that leadership in accessible ways and, and, and moving beyond a really confined, narrow, hierarchical um, perspective of one kind of ministry. There are the broader issues across the society of higher education and so that is another piece that we need to work on collectively as well as thinking about education uu education in ways that we're going to educate folks families children in new ways as we see what's happening to our larger public school system across the country <laughs>
has tons of well-educated teachers, professors, ministers, lay persons, and congregants. Plenty have read or written books or dissertations on things like diversity, radical, radical inclusion, etc. We even have an annual reading list paying attention to We even have an annual reading list that a person has given paying attention to because all they see are literary book clubs created around them that actually make action plans and take it forward for them from their communities. Sustaining a congregation is hard work. We all recognize that. But it seems like there is a tending of a flock to sustaining white comfort and supposed allyship rather than actual nourishment for a movement or a change. UU Identity seems to believe that reading about a problem is solving the problem. <laughs> a. <laughs> and there is ABC. What will you bring as a UUA president to the table of our self congratulating culture of white action? B. Do you believe the UU Identity should be a platform for radical inclusion? And C, do we see much less formally educated people making much more progress than the large amount of people, excuse me, why do we see much less formally educated people making much more progress than the large amount of people we have who have academically explored the problem? Books do change a lot, okay? We have a printing press that has the honor of causing multiple disturbances every year. And, and they're going from publishing 25 books a year to 35 books a year. None of which we capture the authors speaking about. You notice that? We don't capture that and deliver it to you as Unitarian Universalists, you know? Well, that's something I want to change, okay? So, reading Soul on Ice, when I was 14, changed me. So it still can happen. We want it still to happen that we read, right? Yes. Yes. Secondly, um, there is the self-congratulatory, I read that book, Club, um, which we all have to challenge ourselves on. And everybody would rather read a lighter tone than to read Derek Bell, or to stop and go deep on James Baldwin. So one of the things we have to do is face that we have to quit going light on allyship and on education, which is what you do when you don't put prioritization higher on that, okay? Should we include a platform for racial inclusion? Who asked that question? You were being rhetorical, right? <laughs> Radical inclusion should be, should include everyone, even Republicans, <laughs> even socialists, right? And it shouldn't throw souls overboard. So every humanist in Unitarian Universalism should have a home, right? And why do we see much less formally educated people making more progress than the large amount of people who we have academically explored the problem with? Well, sometimes they're real. <laughs> and the fake fights win instead other times. But sometimes you need a good analysis, don't you? You need a good professor to write a good book. You need a good author to write a good book so you can blow your mind. The reality of what we're doing is we've been trying to do it with cheap grace. Cheap grace, folks. It's the easy thing. We want to do the easy things. And I know we want to pick the low-hanging fruit first. But we've got to improve our analysis 
to get more sophisticated. Yes? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Too often our work on critical justice issues feels overly focused on process, language, and resolutions, and not on action. And we have to change that. And you know, going back to the Congregational Study Action issue at GA, I thought every single one of the um, selections, with the exception of the National Conversation on Race, was a self-congratulatory statement and an opportunity to pat, pat ourselves on the back. So yes, this is a true reflection of where our justice work is right now. Yes, UU identity needs to be a platform for radical inclusion. That is our theology. Universalism is a theology of radical inclusion. So there's no question about that. The question is, are we ready to live that? And, you know, I've been wrestling with this question about politics and we, we have radical inclusion in our vision. And so people have said, well, what about Republicans and Trump supporters and things like that. And, you know, I do think that everyone is welcome, but that we have to be clear about where we stand with respect to human dignity and where we stand with respect to the earth. And that we can't compromise what we believe to make everyone feel comfortable. I mean, we've got to take a stand, we've got to move forward, and we hope that everyone will join us and it's not picking people out, but it's being clear that we're not gonna, we don't need unanimity to move forward. In Phoenix, we didn't have unanimity on standing up to Sheriff Arpaio, but we had enough of, we had strength behind that vision, so we were able to move forward. And other people stuck with us even though they didn't agree because of the spiritual depth of the community. And then why do, um, why do people understand this issue who are not just being informed by academics because they are living the injustices in their families and directly in their lives. And that is why partnership is absolutely essential to how we move forward. I remember um, before we shut down the jail, uh, people saying to me, is this, what's the strategy? I don't know if this is gonna work. We're gonna shut down the jail one day. Our pile won't be able to go after the Latino community. What's the, what's the real change? But the real change was the Department of Justice was there and they interviewed all of us about what was going on with the jail and it created the pressure on the federal government to act and help us get rid of Arpaio and restrict his power. So that strategy came from undocumented immigrants protecting their families. It wasn't an academic strategy from white new youths, right? So we've gotta be in partnership. We've gotta follow the leadership of movements of color and you use in our own movement of color. We've got to move beyond the exceptionalism of what has come to define our faith for too long and follow. So I think there was a shadow side even of the anti-racism movement back in the UA when we were sustaining leadership development networks around um, proactive movements on that issue. And it definitely was analysis paralysis or who has the best analysis and people in a room competing kind of who, who gets this the best. Um, uh, and, and very often people who weren't getting it at all, if that's sort of the extent. Um, and so I know that there were many times that I felt um, frustrated in those rooms. And that's some of the, um, some of what propelled me forward in my own community in a time when the racial rhetoric was thick coming out of uh, the powers that be. And the mayor sought to criminalize and arrest and deport and actually to be uh, the first the first town, he wanted the distinction to be the first town where police officers uh, were deputized as, uh, as um, ICE officials in the whole country. And so felt moved out of those rooms to actually um, have the experiential learning. I think that this is also a matter of head and heart, that Unitarians sometimes 
are so busy figuring out whether they have the right analysis that they forget that we must live into experiences of injustice. And actually, this has to be our struggle, all of our struggle, or we won't have the dedication to actually keep on moving beyond our own lifetime, which is the kind of work that we need to be leaning into. Another thing is, when I get at these self-congratulatory tables, the challenge is that we have a feeling that it would never be about one table. The congregations that are thriving and growing are actually creating many tables where people can self-determine what is happening in worship or how their children are being educated, and people are, people are making different choices. We cannot create this myth that all Unitarian Universalists want the same thing, the same food. Um, it's just it's just not true. So what does it look like to, to have a vision of many tables? That's what radical inclusion is partly about. And again, I think less formally educated people make more progress because um, at times, because it is their fight. It's their fight of their lives. And so they can't give up. We talk about the White House being on fire. The White House has been on fire. Many people's houses have been on fire. And it's when we can see that while so much has changed, nothing has changed, then we do not see ourselves as being a part of it. this fight. We see ourselves as only having the capacity to partner. And I think we must lift up and not invisibilize the people of color, the poor people, the people struggling, the trans-identified people who are in our pews, whose houses are on fire. We must lift them up and join them. All right, thank you very much, all three candidates. It's, uh, I know these have been some tough questions and you've all done a marvelous job, but it's going to get a lot rougher. <laughs> because we have Grace, Jason, and Nehemiah, our youth, are going to represent our youth with three more questions, but the good news is it's their last three. <laughs> so I will, at this time, ask our youth to make their way towards the microphone. So first we have Grace from Colorado, and uh, Susan, I think you're up for the first question. All right, hi guys. Um, so I'm Grace, I'm from Denver, Colorado. And in my church, I am the only black person. I'm the only person of color. So I am counted on to attend all the meetings, the boring adult meetings, all of the, I'm sorry, adults. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm required to attend and we want my opinion. And I've noticed, not in my community, since I am the only person of color in my community, but in other many but in any, many other youth communities, the children and young adults are more diverse than the regular and normal adults. Um, <laughs> so my question to you is, why do you think this is, and how, if you were a black president, would you address, uh, address this issue to integrate more diversity into the adult youth community? It's true in Phoenix, too, where our youth and children's ministry is the most diverse um, part of our ministry, the most diverse part of our congregation. I think that's because um, families are more diverse, um, that well, there's a couple of factors. I mean, there can be adoption and fostering um, of children of color by white families um, within Unitarian Universalism, as well as um, just increasing diversity of our families. But I think, you know, adoption and fostering is part of it. And your, your second so your question was why is that? And what do we do about it? Is that right? Um, well, I think it is the response that we can't just, we have to put voices of people of color in the center, but we also can't, um, fail as white people to unpack our own privilege and unpack our own, the white supremacy that lives inside of us, to learn the forms of multiculturalism, to grow with a multicultural mindset and skill set um, so that we can create a more inclusive community for all people, so that we create and start taking down the barriers and obstacles um, that 
make our communities uh, inhospitable to people of color, that's critical. So it's not just depending on people of color to change our congregations, right? It's white people, white leadership doing the change that's gonna create a cultural change in our congregations to make them open to greater diversity. And some of that though can come from our children and our children's ministry program. And one of the things in Phoenix is we have made a lot of intentional work around creating a radically inclusive children's ministry program. So I think that's another reason why we are seeing increasingly children of color coming into our congregation. And our RE program, they now are naming themselves revolutionary education. Right? So I think there's education there that can inform the adults of the community about how we create really inclusive community across diversity. So something I have been reflecting on recently, especially looking at the people that are coming to our congregations, the, the families of, of um, all different backgrounds, everyone is really testifying, even as we've become more diverse, the parents and children, the children of color, the white children, the, the parents, um, multiracial families, as well as white families, for example, are testifying that the congregations, Unitarian Universalist congregations, are the whitest place that they are all week. So I think that's something I wanted to lift up. I haven't um, heard it said that way, even about experiences of, of white children. And I think that's something we need to really um, wrestle with. And I, I mentioned earlier, I think for youth and young adults of color who are so often in a much more multiracial experience, we need to improve the networks that they have with one another outside of the congregation so that they do have um, a different experience where they can see that Unitarian Universalism is a home. Um, I think of the Finding Our Way Home Conference, but places or drum youth and young adults of color where people realize and have experiences that Unitarian Universalism is not always white-centered, nor should it be always that way. I, I think the UUA can drive um, resources. What about our orientations? What about our getting to know you? How do we tell people who are coming to our congregations about who is a Unitarian Universalist? And again, when we only lift up those white saints or the his, tell the history as a white history and maybe mention something about a controversy 50 years ago um, for a couple of lines, then we do a disservice. How, what does our shared history look like and what does that mean for us moving into the future? I also think our congregation, a congregation, I believe that one of the reasons we're growing more diverse is that we are representing the multicultural experiences, the multiracial experiences, the multigenerational experiences of the people who are a part of our congregation. And when it's a congregation that doesn't present one way of being, then someone who comes in is much more likely to say, I am free to express who I am. This is a place that welcomes and includes me. I absolutely think radical inclusion is what we need to be about. And then finally, the experience that I know, having been raised a lifelong Unitarian Universalist, which makes me cringe every time, is when somebody who's 19 or 22, an African American lifelong Unitarian Universalist, is welcomed into our faith by someone, usually a white person, who's maybe been a Unitarian Universalist for three years, and has the assumption <laughs> that this is not their home. We really need to drive a conversation about who belongs and open the, our, our culture of belonging. Hey Grace, thank you for the question. And I'm sorry you have to go to those meetings. <laughs> but you don't really have to go, you know that, right? Oh yeah, I refuse. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, um, at those meetings uh, are people who are trying to do good with the systems and tools they have in their bag, you know? And they long ago needed to add new tools to their bag, and they haven't always known where to go to get help to do that, and they have sometimes been given the help and walked away from it, okay? Because it was easier. 
not true. And probably because of that and some other reasons, you're, you're the person in your congregation. And so you've had to represent a lot of people in this room have been called on in their lives to represent. I don't want to see you do that for that reason. But when I first joined Unitarian Universals in the church school where I joined in Portland first, the RE school was deserted. And all those kids who were in that program have grown up now. And I was just there. And they're not my kids. This is our real problem. This is our real problem, and it has been for 40 years. Is that we have spot programs that will not hold your hand the whole way through. We don't take seriously every weekend. And it's not just that the RE program didn't do perhaps all it could have, but the parents have. Parents think getting their kids there two Sundays a month is just fine, thank you very much. We have this happen a lot. Um, on the staff team, we have this discussion about the difference between black church culture and white church culture, and how people come if, if it's convenient to their schedule at a UU church. And at black churches, you have ministry. And you wouldn't dream of not showing up or having somebody take your place. How do we become black church culture in the Unitarian Universalist Association so that you can choose the job you want? <laughs> We're going to hear from Jason from Charlotte. Hi, hello. All right, so my name is Jason from Charlotte, North Carolina. So my question is, what is your mission as a person, and how do you plan to accomplish your said mission? Well, my mission is connected to that creative healing power of love and how it calls me out into brokenness in our world and, and in our lives. And I'm going to answer that question in connection with why we're all here. And I, I talked about this at the beginning that I, I, I know, uh, I know from so many individuals who have told me over the years that really Unitarian Universalism is the place the best place for them for their spirit song. And they enter a community and their instrument is not welcome. And so I really believe that in this time, one of the most important things that we have to do in our tradition is, is to, to remove the obstacles that keep people on the outside that are longing to be a part of our faith that actually identify as Unitarian Universalists outside. And we, who are we, who am I, to decide that someone that is reinforcing the opposite of universalist vision, who is not worthy of our message and faith? Everyone is worthy of our message and faith. And so we must, must lean into the changes that are necessary in order to support communities of color. And I think there's so much we can learn. I'll say this. The more work that I do around Black Lives Matter in Morristown and the more work that I do with immigrants, there is such a clear commitment to the generations to reaching back to supporting our children and supporting our elders. If we actually allow ourselves to be transformed by creating more wholeness in our congregations and then more effective justice work in the world beyond, all of us will have lives that are lifted up. I see people in their 70s and 80s and their 17 and 18 on the margins, and whenever I work with communities of color, they insist that the children's lives be tended. 
it seems like a very white cultural thing to sort of abandon children while they uh, are away from home for the first time if they choose to move away from home for college. How can we not just change <laughs> because we want people to be connected to our faith, but because we don't actually know it all, that we are more whole and a more holy community when we allow ourselves to have our faith soar on the visions and of so many people. It is imperative, imperative that we lean into this work. Thank you for that question. So um, I'll go next, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I didn't choose my mission in life. It was kind of given to me by circumstance. I was perfectly happy as an only child and my family then went on and had another six kids. <laughs> <laughs> so from the start, two things have been my mission. One is love. Love, give them love. And the other is be responsible. And no matter what I do, and no matter how much I learn, and no matter where I go, that's who I am. And maybe at some points, if I had a different set of circumstances, I might have a different analysis, but I hear my mom's voice. But Carrie, why did you choose this? And it applies no less now than it did then. It's just a bigger family. So we do what families do. We add a little more water to the soup, and we pull up another table, another chair to the table, and we figure out how to share more fairly, and we make sacrifices, and that's a word you're not gonna hear in the RE program of Unitarian Universalist Church very often, but that's what we have to do. So my mission guides me in that. Love them and be responsible. And uh, as president of the UVA, I can go do that. molecular biology as an undergraduate, thought I wanted to be a scientist. And it was very clear during those studies that it was not my path. So I started a regular meditation practice, and I suspect I learned something about meditation and UU, religious education, as a kid. But I was looking for where my gifts might meet the world to you. And three things came to me out of that practice. Number one, that I wanted to work in community. That I wanted to work with other people because we are more effective when we work together. Number two, I wanted to be a part of creating more justice in the world. And number three, probably the most important, is that I wanted to see more love in the world. Not romantic love, not just love of tribe, but revolutionary love, agape love, a universal overflowing love for all people. And that has remained my call, my calling, to help unlock the power of love in the hearts of one another, in the hearts of our world. And it's taken me all over the country and to different places in the world and I started to feel a calling to run for UUA president at the end of Justice GA because I saw what we were capable of, capable of when we put our hearts and our spirits first, when we were willing to leave behind how we'd always done things in order to make a difference. And I want to see more of that everywhere we are and in all of us. 
leading through love, leading through moral courage, moving beyond our comfort and the way we've always done things. Because this moment is too urgent for us not to unlock the boldness and the braveness and the love of our faith. So that continues to be my calling. Thank you for the question. Okay, so now we're to our final question from Ian Myers and from Samantha.
be walking with a sign. Um, I'm like my fellow candidates here, I, I have sensible shoes for those of us. Uh, will, you, will you think about walking with me though? There'll, there'll be some event where I'll need you there, if I'm present, right? And, and the real question is, do you and I have a relationship? When you need me, you'll call me? And when I need you, I'll call you? And we'll go so that when Susan says, come to Phoenix, we'll show up. Because I, I stood right there looking into Susan's eye when she had on these lovely PVC connectors at the doorway to Joe Arpaio's jail because she and others said, come. And I went to Charlotte because Reverend Barber said, come. Okay? That's the real heart of the thing. It's when someone asks, I need you. Will you go there? And be in the relationship of accountability that says, I will go. Even if it's inconvenient, I will go. Now, if I'm on my deathbed, if, I, if I'm in jail, if, if I have no money to get there, I'll try to send something. Okay? But you and I, we're going to march, okay? I don't know when we're going to march, but we're going to march together. All right? And we're going to do it because we're in a countable relationship. So just to be clear, Yumai is my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and the 30 pound sign was definitely a village reference. <laughs> Specifically with the high heels, so you kind of got the wool pulled out. I miss the thirty pounds. We have dry humor in our family. Uh, so we are we are at our, we are past our time, and so what we'd like to do is to cut our closing remarks if you want to offer them in the reverse order, which we did them in at, at one minute versus the two. So uh, again, we thank you for your time, everyone, for being such great participants and for our honored guests and for being here, and we'll end with these uh, closing remarks with our utter gratitude for you being here, both the audience and the Was that me? Okay. Standing. There are no magic answers. The journey is continuing to be long. It is a marathon, you know that. But I have the record that tells you I'm serious about this. I want to be president of the UUA, but I don't want to do it if it's the same old same. Time for change, time for a new vision, time for a belief that this faith of ours is a saving faith, a faith with a real theology, diverse and rich, like a stew that you eat on a cold day. And you and I are in relationship. It will grow deeper and it will include new people and more people. And we can create the love of community. I believe that one of the reasons that I was nominated by the Presidential Search Committee is that I have decades of service and leadership in changing Unitarian Universalist institutions at the congregational level and at the national level and in different sized institutions in between. I am deeply committed to the change work that allows more people who are hungering for what our faith has to offer to find themselves connected to our life-saving faith. I believe that this is about looking at what it, what it looks like to ignite faith across the generations and not to take hiatuses. I believe it's about 
looking at what it is to live into this moment, the religious pluralism of the day. Two of my last four new members were of Muslim backgrounds. We must move past the confines of the 1950s church. It's about empowering change, not just welcoming new people. It's about advancing justice. It's about leading with love. This is a defining moment. Now more than ever, we need to unlock our bravest, boldest, most loving selves for this time. And there are three things the UUA and our faith needs to do. Number one, ground ourselves in spiritual vitality, because we are going to need spirit to give us courage and resilience for this time. Number two, we need to be grounded in partnership. And this means moving beyond individual congregations to be in stronger relationship with each other, as well as partnering beyond Unitarian Universalism with grassroots movements for change. And number three, we need to be organized for impact. Our institution means nothing if it is not a tool for living our faith in the world. And we need to switch our mindset from institutional maintenance to organizing for love and justice in our world. That is what this moment means for us, and that is what I'm committed to doing, and that is what I've been doing in Phoenix for nine years now. And I have congregational packets that will tell you how you can vote, and you can take information back to your congregation. I'm gonna leave them up here in case you wanna take one home. Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you again so much for your patience couple of things. We still had four questions that you all submitted, and what we're going to do is make sure that we share those questions with the candidates. We'll work out an opportunity for you all to respond in writing and to share their comments with you so that you can have responses to all of the questions that were submitted, those that we heard here and those that we did not get a chance to get to. Didn't want you to think anybody was being ignored or erased in that, okay? And candidates, please stay up here for a photo op. Everybody else, go eat. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Could you put them on that table there? Oh, no, this is great. I'm going to do a thing, so. Yes.